Okay, uh, we, might, we might start. People are starting to sort of filter in. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today for the retail negotiation webinar, uh, one of the key areas of advocacy of a, of for Ausveg is the retail competition and price transparency areas. And we know that with uh, rising input costs, growers have been squeezed even more. So we know it's important that we can maximise all the returns for growers that we can, and part of that is giving them skills at the retail negotiation table. So Ausveg has partnered with NextGen to offer growers an introduction to developing retail negotiation skills. Uh, the webinar is presented by Neil Recklin. Welcome, Neil. Neil is the director of NextGen Group, which specialises in capability development and business development planning. In his 20 years in Australia, Neil has been front and centre in the development of both category and capability solutions. He has worked extensively with both retailers and manufacturers. And for the past seven years, he's led the next gen involvement in the grocery code of conduct, working with manufacturers, industry bodies, and the ACCC to continue the evolution of the code in Australia. Neil has a passion for helping suppliers in their engagements, sometimes challenging engagements with the major retailers and wholesalers. For the past three years, the next gen team has been very actively supporting manufacturers in their quest to recover significant increases in the input costs through retail price increases. Neil is a regular presenter at industry forums and a contributor on Retail Matters with Channel 9, ABC and Sky News. Um, Neil's happy to take questions throughout the presentation and we can also take some questions at the end. Um, and also highlighting that we will be offering a extended two-day retail negotiation course um, I'll hand it over to Neil. Thanks, Neil. Wonderful. Many, many thanks, Lucy. I, it, makes, it makes me feel really old with these bios. Um, all right. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this will work. I was just saying to uh, to the guys, unfortunately, my laptop died. Uh... There we go. That should now. Is that showing, Lucy? Yes, that's great. Thanks, Neil. And moving. Yes, all good. fantastic. Thank you. So, uh, so my name is Neil. I'm one of the partners at NextGen. Uh, I've got an hour or so together. There's, uh, there's, uh, looks like a big agenda, but I'm, I'm just going to talk around some of those points. So, and as Lucy said, very happy to take questions either in the messages um, and or put your hand up or, or just shout. Um, I'll touch briefly when well, I'm looking sideways, by the way, because the screen's over there and my camera's here. So, look at a little bit of retail DNA. So, what drives the retailers? Because that that very much um, sits at the heart of how we negotiate with them, how we engage with them, um, what it is they're trying to do and subsequently what we um, are pressured to do by them. Uh, what impact does that then have on, on the suppliers and, and how, do you, how do you approach that and uh, lean into that? Uh, and, and a big part of that is the position and the role that you play in their business and or their category. Um, and uh, that, uh, I guess, empowers you in various different ways in that negotiation Power sits at the heart of it, um, how much power you've got. And that's always uh, one of those um, challenging ones. The retailers will uh, have you feel that you have no power and it's all for them and you best not upset them. Um, in reality, it's not quite as black and white as that. Um, I'll touch a little bit on, on the grocery code. It's not intended to be a grocery session or grocery code session. Um, but the code, the grocery code is there. It was uh, launched back in 2015. So uh, it's been around for a goodly while now. Um, and it is there and does uh, support the way in which um, any supplier to uh, the uh, the retailers uh, uh, does business with the retailers and, and importantly, how it uh, influences and shapes and, and governs the, the retailer's behaviour towards those suppliers. And uh, certainly as part of the negotiation framework we put in place, we look to leverage that extensively um, in the way that um, in the way that we uh, we front into those retailers. And I say, it's also wholesalers. When I talk about the trade, there's always Coles, Aldi, Costco, Metcash, IGA, Banner Groups. Uh, predominantly, the majority of the negotiation conflict or challenge we see is with Woolworths and Coles, with exceptions always um, that we find as a general rule that Woolworths are more aggressive um, and front foot in their negotiations than Coles are with their suppliers. 
We've been around for a bit now. I came over to Australia in 2002, um, started next year in 2010. Um, got a team here um, in Australia and also over in, uh, in Auckland, do a bit of work over there, both with retailers and suppliers. Um, we don't work with walls or coals here currently. We have worked extensively with coals in the past. Um, up until 2015, we were running their Category Academy for them, so teaching buyers how to manage categories, N not how to negotiate with suppliers, but how to physically manage, um, manage categories. Uh, and in the last five years, predominantly, we've really been sucked into uh, managing conflict. Uh, when a supplier is having an issue with a retailer, how do they, how do they manage that? Uh, when they've got cost pressures, how do they put a price increase through? When they've um, got a range review coming up, how do they manage um, that in interaction? And uh, over that time, we've also then become partners with uh, people like the Australian Food and Grocery Council, um, Food Service Australia, Food Innovation Australia, Osvaldo, obviously Dairy Australia, and so on and so forth. So um, we 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 like to think that you know we are you know for the industry by the industry. So. Um, a grocery DNA, what we call DNA, and 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 there's no there's no kind of simple um, way of describing it. And I've I've tried to simplify it, you know, to make it, you know, they buy stuff and they sell stuff. <laughs> it's more complicated than that, I know. But you know, first and foremost, they've got to have the right product on shelf all of the time. So that's the absolute golden rule of retail: is have something to sell. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's cheap, expensive, um, high margin, low margin. If I haven't got something on shelf. Um, I'm not I'm not retailing. So number one, get the right products on any product on shelf. Number two, get the right products on shelf. Um, and number three, then make sure that it's priced effectively in the marketplace so I can attract shoppers to my store. Um, and then then pretty much last in that list is and then buy well. Uh, so if I haven't got if I'm trying to just buy well, and, and this is a part of the journey that Metcash have been on, they, they, they started life off very much about how do I effectively buy well and um, losing sight of the fact that they need to sell well. Um, and it's the same with Wolves and Coles. First and foremost, sell well and then buy well after that. If I have shoppers coming into my store to buy cucumbers, great. Um, I need cucumbers on shelf. The last job is to get, obviously, the best cucumbers I can at the best possible price I can, but but not forsaking uh, consistency of supply or quality of product. So that then translates into kind of the margins that you would typically hear about. And it's important to understand these margins uh, or these uh, KPIs because it, it defines the negotiation arena that you can lean into. Um, and more often than not, we uh, we hear almost exclusively it's all about margin. Well, it, it just isn't, by the way. Um, margin is important, but all those other things, I'm not going to read them at you, um, are as equally important. Um, I can make whatever margin I like on a product just by putting my retail price up. The consequence, of course, is that I might not sell any. So I'm making a perfect margin and selling absolutely zip. Um, and then the product starts uh, rotting on shelf and I end up throwing it away. So I've got to get the balance right between these KPIs, um, even though you might just as, um, as, as growers, as brand owners, distributors of product, You'll often just get beaten over the head with give me a lower price, give me a lower price. I've got to make a better margin. My costs have gone up. COVID has driven operational costs into my business. My supply chains are in a world of pain. Scots have fallen over. Pallets are in scarce supply. You've got to give me a better price. We've all heard it. It's it's the standard rhetoric, but we can stretch the conversation beyond that um, through to rate of sale, loyalty, delivered in full on time, minimum life on receipt, all those good retailer metrics that can form part of that um that negotiation arena and, and and enable you to to push the dialogue beyond just price silly little example of that um we did a lot of work working with bp of all people uh, a little while back and bp um as in the petrol station but this is the, the parent company sell fuel and, and lubricants to uh, people like Qantas. um the price is set in singapore so there is no negotiation on price so you say well how can i negotiate when there's no negotiation on price. And it's all the other things that start becoming ever more important around supply, around service, around consistency, around quality. So the first thing we really challenge suppliers to think about when they're uh, approaching a negotiation is what's beyond price? What are the other things that you can bring into that conversation that aren't just price? That then translates into kind of the pressure, if you will, that is put on to the buyers. 
And you know, we've worked in retail in in the past, and most of them are thoroughly nice people. Um, they're not, you know, three three horned monsters. Um, they have mothers, they have fathers, they have children. Um, they're generally quite normal human beings, albeit it doesn't always feel like that. Um, the the fight that most buyers are are fronting into is is they've got to grow their category. So I sit there as a general manager with maybe 20, 30 categories under me. I've got a I've got a growth target. All of my categories have got to grow. Um, I've got a win share off Woolworths, or I've got a I've got to you know grow my margin, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, there's a constrained pool of meals that we eat. Um, generally speaking, seven evening meals a week, um, maybe five breakfasts and uh, some sandwiches at lunch. Uh, changing those macro habits is incredibly difficult. Changing the mix of those macro habits is incredibly difficult. And there's typically seven or so main meals that we rotate through as a as a nation. Um, steak and chips, bag bowls, stir fries, and so on and so forth. Changing that is very, very hard. So you're fighting in a fairly static, constrained pool. So by default, I've got to start stealing. Um, I've got to steal from my competitor retailers or I've got to steal from other category managers in my business. So I'm the, the pasta buyer. I've got to steal from the veggie buyer or the meat buyer or the dairy buyer because I've got to get more pasta in the meal occasion um, through my uh, through my shoppers. So there's all these pressures that come to play, um, none of which are easy levers to manipulate, which is why it typically comes down to, well, if I can buy a little bit better, um, get a lower price, that flows straight through to the bottom line. And as a rough rule of thumb, if a Woolworths and a Coles makes about a five margin, 5% 5 operating margin at the end of the year, the math says for every $20 of incremental sales, they make a dollar profit. If I can lean on you and get you to give me a dollar, that's a damn sight easier than trying to grow my sales by $20 and or steal from the spag bowl meal occasion and or steal from Coles or whatever it might be. So... And and when I do that, of course, they're gonna they're gonna fight back. Um, so I, I win some share from Woolworths, and they're gonna come back with deeper prices and more promotions or whatever it might be. If I get a margin point from you, generally it's for life. Um, I get to keep that margin point for an extended period of time, um, if not forever. And your funding, well, you've got to lap your funding, obviously. So anything you gave me over and above, I want that next year as well. And you know, you know the game. So as a as a buyer, my primary job is is to manage my category to make sure I've got product on shelf, the right product, right price. But a big part of it then is how do I put pressure on my suppliers to get better margins? Um, and you know, if you're a brand owner, appreciate in 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 the fruit and veg space, there's limited brands. Moving brands is a good way of doing it. Um, moving product groups is is another way of doing it within categories as well. Um, we can beat up on the uh, you know the cabbage guys by going hard on lettuce or whatever it might be. You know I can change the dynamics to put pressure on different verticals within uh, within my category. That then reads through to uh, suppliers. Um, you know the pressure is relentless. Um, the hammer never stops hammering, and the lime never never stops getting squeezed. Um, and whatever you gave last year isn't enough this year, and whatever you give this year is not enough for next year. Um, because unfortunately, the way that Western economy works, and this isn't an Australia problem, it's a generally a Western a Western problem, is you know, and all of you with uh, with uh, um, uh, pensions with supers uh, likely have shares in Woolworths and Coles, and your, your your super providers will be looking for better returns from Woolworths, which is why they put your super money into Woolworths. Which means year on year the the retailer's got to get better. Which year on year means they've got to put more pressure on you. It really is pretty 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 linear in that regard. Um, so I have to I have to be more efficient in what I do as a retailer, which means I have to put more pressure on you for margin. Ideally, I want a rationalised range. Ideally, I want to have fewer, bigger, better supplies. Um, I want innovation, um, but but none of this at the expense of not having product available. And this is one of the the beautiful levers that in negotiation we seek to to, to bring to the table. Um, they say I need a better margin, but the point at which product supply comes into question, then um, the margin conversation starts becoming um, secondary. Remember the golden rule, product on shelf, number one priority. Number four priority, buy well. Okay, so uh, becoming a, a good supplier in terms of quality and consistency can have a massive impact on the way that you negotiate around around margin. So, unfortunately, from a, a supplier perspective, um, it's not easy, and it won't get easier. And the last bullet point here is um, 
is one that I'll, I'll flesh out a little bit as we go because it's it's a, it's it's common to all suppliers. This kind of fear of disappointment or fear of retribution and um, Warbus and Coles, you know, the the, the 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 lords and masters, and I don't want to upset them in any way, shape, or form. I certainly wouldn't want to complain. I wouldn't put my hand up and say that's not fair or right because I might get my head kicked. Um, there is maybe some truth in that, but I will I will talk about that a bit more as we go. Um, there are ways of of mitigating that. Uh, and certainly in the way that we counsel uh, suppliers to negotiate with uh, with retailers, leans heavily into um, managing that relationship dynamic and dialogue uh, and finding ways of um, preventing this kind of retribution or punitive behaviour from the retailers. Um, and I'll touch on, on the grocery code, which is there to do exactly that uh, a little later. Um, I'm sure Lucy will be happy to share um, some of these slides you know, later. And I, I don't intend to spend a lot of time on this, but this is a, a, a dummy's guide to retailing. Um, and it's important to understand from a supplier perspective as to where you sit. Um, and, and kind of, I'll, I'll give you a couple of dumb examples. Um, if I'm a Coke 24 pack or a Pepsi Max 24 pack, I clearly sit right down here in this, in this you know, tra traffic driving footfall driving, promote hard or go home. Um, the retailers make pretty ordinary margins of that kind of stuff. It's not about making margin. It's about driving traffic. I tolerate low margins because I'm using it as a marketing lever to drive people into my store. In the diametrically opposed top box, silver polish. Um, you know, we we I got married a, a long time ago. Aunt Bessie, who brought us the silver cutlery for our wedding, um, is coming around for dinner. I need to clean the silver. I go to Woolworths or Coles. I expect to be able to buy silver polish. I couldn't tell you what the price is. I don't care what the price is. Um, it's a service line, and I expect the retailer to make an absolutely rude margin on it, but I expect them to have it in stock. And they're not going to sell a lot of it, but they make good margin, and that's okay. Um, the green box at the top there is where I've got something that is a bit more unique, a bit special. Um, I can't easily replicate it. I, can't, I don't want to do without it as a retailer. I make good margins out of it, and shoppers love it. Um, there's not a lot of stuff that lives up there. Um, if you can live up there, that's a wonderful, wonderful place because you have significantly more power, I'll lead it into power in a moment, significantly more power in the negotiation you've got. So there's power in each of these, I'll say four boxes, I mean three in reality. If you're a new line or a service line, you've got power because you're unique. If you're driving traffic, you've got power because availability, promotions, becomes critical if you're in the green box, you have power because you deliver great margins and you're really important to their shoppers. If you're in the gray box, you are in a world of pain. Um, you're a product that shoppers don't really want, um, retail doesn't really make any margin out of, and you're likely to have a fairly short existence um, and or the margins will be pushed um, further north to make it a service line like silver polish. Um, so, you know, in your space, there's probably not a lot of stuff that sits in that in that bottom. Um, but if it does, you'll typically see the retailer rationalize their suppliers, rationalize their range um, and push it margin wise uh, north into the service line. So where you sit in that matrix shapes profoundly how you it gives you different rights in the way that you approach your negotiation. Um, and most suppliers are told they are. Um, useless, they're horrible, their margins are lower than over category margins. Um, you know, you've got competitors that are better than, you know, there's all that is intended to to keep suppliers. Um, and I'm, I'm hamming it to make the point. They're not all like that. But the less you believe what, what you've got is special, the better it is for me as a buyer to negotiate with you. If I tell you what you've got is special, then I'm likely to fare worse in a negotiation as a buyer. So my job is to tell you you're not good. Your job is to work out where you sit in this matrix um, at a category and then at a, at a subcategory and or product level to work out where you sit and how much influence you genuinely do have. Um, and we saw that polarized um, earlier this year with you know anyone that had lettuces was able to sell them at whatever price they wanted to. Cucumbers for a bit, you know, were, you know, I was paying I think $7, $8 a cucumber. Um, clearly there were supply issues. At that point, you know, you're up here and he who's got good supply at those prices is king. Um, it's not about margin. Won't stop the buyer saying your margins are outrageous. I need to buy at a lower price whilst I'm selling, you know, this is at nine, ten dollars. Um, I'll still, you know, buy them from you at a dollar if I possibly can. 
or hold you to a contract that is no longer reasonable or viable. Um, but I'll try and lean to the fact that I contract with you, uh, but let's sit for a dollar. And we've uh, front into to front, fronted into many of those fights uh, that just aren't reasonable or fair. So, you know, what, what is power? Um, and, you know, dumb example, you know, the life ring, well, what's it worth? Um, if, I'm, uh, if I'm in the deep end and I'm drowning, there's no price you can put on that life ring. It, uh, it's invaluable. Um, the buyer will never tell you that they're drowning. They'll never tell you they need a life ring. Um, they'll never come towards you necessarily with a, with a you know, I'll, I'll give you extra because I like you kind of conversation. But knowing knowing where your power sits and how to manipulate that power is a, a huge part of what uh, we suggest suppliers do um, and negotiations all around the preparation. 10% of the negotiation is actually negotiating with the buyer. 80, 90% is all of the work that goes in upfront to work out what your power is and how do you build your power to a position where the buyer doesn't hold all the cards. If the buyer holds all the cards, then the only the only variable is price. Um, and that's that's a torrid place to be. Um, because then you know the person that can give the lowest price wins and everyone else, and they generally don't make any money out of that either. Um, it's a it's a, a a nasty, nasty place to find yourself, obviously. Um, the words at the bottom here, the commercial value, creating commercial value um is is absolutely critical um and more often than not we when we work with suppliers we find that they undervalue their commercial contribution or um uh benefit to the retailer some dumb examples and i literally just made them up you know to, to make a point um that the, in the planning you know if you if you've been coming up with innovation you know a different type of of, of vegetable um, a, a, a sub-branded something or other. If, if, uh, and I appreciate that's not not not, not prevalent in this space. Um, you know, if you're the only mint-flavored cucumber, you heard it here first. If there was a mint-flavored cucumber, it'd be going straight my G and T's. And if it was only available in Coles, you'd have me hook, line, and sinker. Um, so, you know, what what is something that is unique? What is the consistency of your supply? Um, can you can you talk about you know first access to crops and I don't operate in your space. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily understand the art of the possible in, in, in growing and, and harvesting and selling. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not a farmer. Um, but there'll be something typically that is unique or special or consistent or valuable in what you do for the retailer. The trick is to work out what that is. What is the thing? Because the reason they're buying from you right now is because there is something in that list that they value. Their job is to hide it from you, um, because if they make you aware of it, you will potentially leverage it to, leverage it to your advantage. So uh, finding out what what value you are offering to others, what is it that's special? What's the commercial contribution you are making to their business, their category um, is a way of building that um, that power base. Uh, calling it out and seeding it well in advance. So this isn't about um, trying to trying to you know do it on the hoof. This is uh, weeks of planning for potentially a day or two's worth of negotiation and finding the three or four or five things yeah. that are the representation of value to your customers. If there was nothing, they probably wouldn't be doing business with you right now. I suspect. So the fact that you're doing business with them means there is something. Your job is to find out what that something or some things are and to, to market the hell out of them. If, you're, if your consistency of supply, your DIFOT's been particularly good, you need to market the hell out of that. Um, and particularly if you know if your competitors aren't as good as you, then that is worth its weight in gold and can become a very significant negotiation uh, lever in the way that you, uh, in the way that you, uh, you do business. Um, so the first question we often ask is, you know, do you need to negotiate? Um, just because the retailer says we're going to negotiate this contract and negotiate, retailers will negotiate, you know, which spider is going to crawl up the wall fastest. I mean, they, their job, they're genetically pre-programmed to negotiate everything. And, and the reason for that is they generally get a better outcome by doing that than not. Um, 
And a yeah, dumb example, you know, you've got two phones on the right there. One's an iPhone, one's not. Um, you go into JB Hi-Fi, good luck asking for $100 off, off an iPhone 14. You're not going to get it. And the reason you're not going to get it is because JB Hi-Fi don't make $100 on an iPhone. So you're paying $1,500, JB Hi-Fi buying it for $1,400 roughly or something in that order. Uh, and, you know, JB Hi-Fi try and negotiate with Apple and say, well, you know, we've got limited supply. Do you, do you want stock or don't you? No problem. If you don't, we'll, you know, we'll go to Harvey Norman. We're, we're fine. Um, so there's generally very little negotiation by the retailer or the supplier to the retailer and subsequently the retailer to the consumer. The phone at the bottom with a quad cam, I believe, is an Oppo. Yes, an Oppo. I'd be shocked if you couldn't get yourself a couple of hundred bucks off in store by trying to negotiate a price because there isn't the demand, there isn't the attraction. There's lots of them. Um, there is, if, I'm sure it makes phone calls just as well as an Apple, probably takes pictures just as well as an Apple, probably plays games just as well as an Apple, but it doesn't have that same um, power uh, in in the way that they can engage with retailers and then obviously with, uh, with their uh, consumers. Samsung, you know, closer to iPhone than Oppo. So understand where you sit, where your power sits. And again, dumb example, lettuces, um, that was late last year, wasn't it now even? Time's flying. You know, lettuces, when there are no lettuces available, you know, of course the retailer is going to want to negotiate the price of a lettuce because that's what they do. Um, it would be a foolish supply to negotiate at that point versus saying, I might let you have, um, you know, a, a truck. Um, uh, I may let you have some pallets, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to negotiate the price. Um, and it's. It's. I suspect uh, the retailers made more out of those shortage of supplies than the suppliers did. I strongly suspect. I don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised. So first and foremost, understand if you need to negotiate. Understand your power, and then how much you need to negotiate. Um, if you're a Me Three, Me Four, Me Five product, and there's more suppliers than you can shake a stick at then typically price becomes the lowest common denominator. But look at all the other things that put you in the mix as well. Um, this is the, the framework that we use. I'm not going to go through this in, 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 in detail, but you can, I mean, you're welcome to screenshot it and I'm, I'm happy to share it, share it through Lucy uh, to those that are interested. Um, the, the bit that I'm going to talk about is, is, is really the, the bit in the middle um, and that's the context. The whole negotiation that you engage with is driven by context, 100% driven by context. And the lettuce example is, is the most beautiful example of context. When there are no lettuces, the context is profoundly different um, versus when we have a lettuce glut. Um, and the way you negotiate needs to be fundamentally different. So one size does not fit all in the way that you approach a negotiation. And this is this is you know the, these first three boxes: negotiation, context, objective, and mandate, and building power, are where that eighty percent of the time are spent. So how you set yourself up for success um, is by far the biggest part of any negotiation. Not how you then go and engage in your personal performance and resilience and so on and so forth. But they are important, bearing in mind that the retailers that you typically negotiate with do this every day. You don't. They're going to be better at it than you. So your preparation and planning needs to be better than theirs because you're unlikely to outperform them in the physical act of negotiation. Uh, that's what they do. That's their job. Uh, like they wouldn't be so good at growing lettuces. They're very good at negotiating. So um, you're good at growing lettuces. You can get better at negotiating, but particularly through getting the context and the power build right up front. Um, never get caught on price alone. Um, it's It's... They don't buy from you just because you're the lowest price. There's something else or other things. Understand what those repertoire of things are and be sure to bring them into the collective of the negotiation. Um, and there's there's never something for nothing. If they're asking for a better price, then what's the contra to that? Um, if it's just a an auction, then um, that's, a, that's a bad place to find yourself generally. And I appreciate those situations do come by when there's a glut of supply. This is a um, a you know uh, uh, for those that uh, that have been around for a bit. The picture on the right is the Bondi tram uh, before they ripped it up, and then decided forty years ago it'd be a really good idea to put some tram tram tracks in and spend a few billion dollars doing it. Um, politics, wonderful thing. So um, what we have spent a lot of time 
doing over the last, well, since 2015, is is understanding working the grocery code of conduct. Um, and many people kind of go, well, yeah, whatever. You know, it doesn't really help us. There's bits in there that profoundly can help you. Um, and um, I've offered to, to Lucy, I'll, I'll happily run a free a free grocery code program for you guys, um, because there's some things in there that I think are absolutely critical um, for for um, uh, you to understand, uh, particularly the ones in bold and italic. I couldn't make them any more obvious. Um, the retailers are required to act in good faith, be reasonable at all times, um, and uh, are subject to a fair dealings test. What that basically means, and the relevance of the Bondi tram, is back in the 60s, the expression that was used by the lawmakers was, um, uh, would the man on the Bondi tram, and it was a man, not a lady or a person, it was a man, unfortunately, back in those days, the man on the Bondi tram, would the man on the Bondi tram think that that is reasonable? Does it pass the sniff test? Or as a politician said a little while back, you know, the man in the pub test. So does it does it pass muster? Would your grandmother say, that's reasonable, dear? Or does it just not sit right? And those provisions within the code are really critical when it comes to the way that you set your negotiation up. Because a retailer, based on the, uh, the constraints the code puts on them, is not allowed to ask of you something that would not be deemed to be reasonable, is in the context of fair dealing, and fair, the word fair is a legal expression in this uh, respect, and that they've done that in good faith. And good faith um, loosely means they have understood the, the risk and the reward to both parties, theirs and yours. So if they know that they're going to make a mutter of a margin and you're going to go bust, well, that is a breach of good faith. They are super sensitive about this. So the trick is finding the way in which you can manipulate the dialogue and the optics of the conversation where you start creating significant discomfort in the retailer because they know that they're overstepping the line in terms of what is reasonable and not acting in good faith or demonstrating fair dealings. So a lot of the work that we do with suppliers is all in that setup, that context, the objective and mandate, and then the power build, using the right expressions, the right words, um, the right email communication to create a, a guide rail or a framework of what does reasonable mean? Is it fair that I sell you a product at less than it costs me to grow it? What would your grandma say? Well, no, dear, of course not. The, the man on the Bondi tram would never agree that is fair and reasonable. If there's a dollar's profit to be made and 98 cents is made by the retailer and two cents is made by the grower, does that pass the sniff test? Not in a million years. So, I know I'm, I'm banging this drum, but it's such an important drum. Um, the way that you you manage that interaction, that dialogue, the words, the emails, that Friday afternoon phone call that you then, and again, I see this all the time, you get that phone call, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, I need this. And the supplier doesn't in turn summarize that email back or summarize that verbal conversation back. And they're often four o'clock on Thursday or Friday conversations, summarize it back on an email. I, from our conversation at 4.15 on Friday, um, gone, my understanding is if I don't do this, you're going to do that. Have I misunderstood? You'd be shocked at how many of these asks go away. Um, rejection of product. There's a whole section in the code around rejection, and then they reject a product for whatever reason, spurious or otherwise, and then they endeavor to negotiate. Sometimes they even negotiate their way out of it. They just tell you, tough, suck it up. Again, there's no end of provisions in the code to prevent that, and there's recompense when it does occur. The words you use are critical in setting up that play and that discussion. Those words are never, I hate you, I'm going to punch you in the head. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm just using very nice, calm language. Have I understood? Have I misunderstood? Is this what you intended? My interpretation was... Um, the position you put on the table would mean that. Um, is that what you intended? So, you know, oh, <laughs> the, the, the pen is mightier than the word is, is never, never, never more true. The way you set yourself up, the way you engage profoundly changes the way that you subsequently negotiate or even potentially don't negotiate. A, a, a good negotiation is one that doesn't start, in my opinion. If you can avoid it altogether, then you didn't give anything. That's a good outcome. So, you know, there's 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 much in the code that um, that can help you. 
Um, the retailers, uh, particularly Woolworths, have become very adept at understanding where those lines sit um, and uh, where to tiptoe up to them. We see buyers tiptoe over them regularly. Make sure everything is in writing, you know, and I appreciate that, you know, when, when you're up at four in the morning, getting on the tractor, putting things in writing isn't necessarily first priority. Um, but sorry to be, to be your dad and say it should be. Um, it, it really, it really must, it absolutely critical that everything is in writing because you can't have a good ding dong with a retailer if it's not in writing or if you can't demonstrate in the nicest possible way that some of the behavior over time has not been fair reasonable or appropriate the first thing we do when we work with suppliers is say right show me the last six months worth of emails show me what's been said now tell me what you said and what they said tell me about the phone calls and there's this chasm between what has been written in email and what was said on uh, on phone calls um, and that's a, that's just not smart from a supplier perspective. So, you know, the golden rules of negotiation, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I've, I've got another 10 minutes before we maybe take some questions. Um, you know, the golden rules of negotiation, if you're playing the ball, not the man, it plays a little bit to this relationship piece. Unfortunately, the buyers are very good at saying, Lucy, I'm really disappointed in the way that you've uh, approached that. I'm really disappointed, Lucy, that um, that you guys have elected to do that. I'm really disappointed that uh, you're not able to supply me. Really disappointed, you, can't, you know. That's standard. That's normal. That doesn't mean they've got a bad relationship with you. That just means that's their play. That's the game. It's theatre. I want you to feel that you are in fear of damaging the relationship that I have, because having a good relationship with me means that you're going to be better off as a supplier. Relationship is a fickle thing. You need to understand it for what it is. Measure it in reality rather than in 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 concept. Um, there are good examples of good relationships and fruitful and beneficial relationships. For every one of those, I can show you ten that is um, coercive or uh, um, just downright unpleasant. Um, packaged up as we're partners. So understand what it is. Measure it for what it is. Recognize it for what it is, and then play accordingly. So always keep it focused on the commercial deal, even if they seem to make it personal. And, and often it's in the tone or the words unspoken where it feels personal. It's not, that's their game. It's their theatre. Controlling the timeline, absolutely critical in a negotiation. Um, Lucy, I've got to get this deal done by Friday. Critical. All I hear there as a supplier is, great, I've now got, you've shown me your deadline. I'm not going to do anything until Thursday afternoon at the earliest because an early deal is not a good deal. Um, rarely. And if you've got a deadline on Friday, I'm going to look for a deal done at 10 past six on Friday night or even Monday morning. So you as a supplier can control the time frame. We've become conditioned as suppliers when the retailer says, get me that information by Thursday, close it by Thursday. We do it. I guarantee four times out of five, nothing's done with that information until Tuesday, Wednesday, the following week. So occasionally you'll get, you know, and I've worked with retailers, I, I know how they play. They'll say that because if I get all the information, I can then manage it on my time frame when I want and I'll put the pressure on you. If I put um, time pressure on you, you're likely to make mistakes as a supplier um, and I'll likely get a better deal as a result. So um, try and take control as best you can of the timeline. If they say Thursday, say, sorry, I'm going to a funeral on Thursday, can't do it, it'll be Monday. Sorry. Um, and you'd be amazed at how often they go, oh, okay. So you've just wrestled back a little bit of control, a little bit of power, and tried to kind of level the playing field. If they say jump, we don't ask how high. We ask why. Um, and and then try and you know, manage the uh, the power balance going forward after that. Point three is my favorite. Um, keeping a buyer busy. It's like anyone that's had children or I've got two uh, – Got a little bit of a property here, and I've got two kelpies. Um, if kelpies aren't aren't kept busy, they are a pain in the butt. And I haven't got any sheep or cows to keep them busy. I've got chickens. Um, if they're not busy, they'll eat a chicken. So um, same with buyers. Um, if they're not busy, they'll eat a supply. Keep them busy. Um, they're very good at offloading. They've got you know maybe 10, 15 suppliers and one buyer. You've got um, two or three customers. They know that you've got more time than them. They're trying to push their workload onto you because they're time poor. Get them to do stuff. Well, you know, I'd, if I can give you 37 mil, 80 mil cucumbers or 90 mil cucumbers, 
or you know, thirty centimeter or forty. You know, so you tell me what what your shoppers think. It doesn't matter what it is. Make some crap up. Um, get them to do something. Give them work. Um, keep them busy. They're time poor. If you start just taking a little bit of their time, they're going to want to get to resolution with you quickly. So subconsciously, they're going to want to get a deal done with you because every time they talk to you, there's an action point for them. Well, that means they're going to look to get a deal done quicker, um, potentially not necessarily be good for you, but it means they're not putting as much uh, energy, effort and fight into doing a deal with you. So control the time frame, control the, um, the, the workload and always, even if it's just a tiny thing, get them to do something for you changes the power balance. Lego bricks um, come in twos, fours, sixes, eights, tens. You know, it does my head when a supplier goes, you know, I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll take it down from 150 to 140. What, why round numbers? Since if I go 150 to 140, as a buyer, all I'm hearing is 137. Because you went 10 in one jump. If you could do 10 in one jump, I know there's another three. If you went 150 to uh, look, you know, the best I can do is 147.3. Just the subtlety of the point three, look, point two then. But you're changing the dialogue. You're not suddenly talking in full sense. You're talking in fractions of sense. You're not talking in tens of sense. You're talking in one sense. So nothing should ever be in big Lego bricks, ever. Um, you know, if you've got to improve the margin for whatever reason, one decimal place, we start at, you know, 47.1 to 47.2, not 47 to 48, because there's a buyer. I know that if you went 100 points, uh, uh, margin points, I know 110 are on the table. It's just how hard I need to push. If you gave me 73, I'm probably thinking maybe 80. Different paradigm. So changing the paradigm of that negotiation and what I give and how I give, absolutely critical and sends a, a, a very different subliminal message to the buyer. I'm already doing fractions of sense here, guys. You're killing me. I haven't got full sense to give. Um, and the preparation, I can't overemphasize that. Um, if you've got a if you've got a major negotiation for price or contract or seasons harvest or whatever it might be, um, you know, the negotiation might take place over you know two or three or four weeks. Collectively, that might be three or four hours. You, there should be 30 or 40 hours of planning ahead of it in that order. Um, and we see that is generally woefully underdone. We find in most industries this concept of role playing it is alien. Um, you know, but running that negotiation through with somebody else just helps raise the questions. What's the thought process? Oh, I said that wrong. That wasn't what I meant. So, yes, dumb stuff can really, really help. Favorite picture. It's all gone to custard. Um, what, what, what do you do? Um, and, you know, there's there's many things you can do. And uh, more often than not, that's when when they've put, you know, very significant um, uh, pressure on you. Uh, I've seen. Um, deals done. In fact, I've, I've, I've quite recently done some work in, in your space and I've seen, seen done, deals done where the fear of missing out overruled the commercials. The deal was done at a net operating loss to the supplier. The deal was done. There was actually high fiving that the deal was done because the concept of getting the deal done overruled the math behind the deal. Um, they would have been far better off actually having a smaller business, not having that contract, right sizing their business and actually making money. Um, that was a better option than the deal that they'd done. Then they found us and said, how do we get out of it? Um, so you're better off doing no deal than a bad deal, generally. Exceptions to that I appreciate, um, but it should always be a consideration that you, you don't do a deal at any cost. And I see that as a pressure way, way too often. Um, walking away is a really powerful message as well. Um, and it's one that... Um, we don't see happen often enough where a supplier goes, you know what, at a dollar forty, I'm I'm out. I can't I can't sell it to you at a dollar forty. That just doesn't work for me. You know, give give me a shout if others others can't do it. I'm happy to come back and talk to you. Um I would say 70% of the time that conversation doesn't finish with okay. It finishes, no, 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 not so quick there, Lucy. Look, I'm sure we can have a conversation about this. I'm sure we can have a conversation. You know, there's something we can do here. I don't want you to walk away. You know, often it ends up that way, but that conversation only starts with I'm out. Can't do that price. Um, doesn't doesn't even get close to working for us. So the theater of that becomes really important. Um, so no deal is better than a bad deal. Um most suppliers are fearful of escalating through to uh, the retailer. 
it is absolutely normal practice for people to escalate within a retailer. So the buyer, category manager, the BCM, the GM, the uh, the executive GM, the MD, they are escalated to every single day of the week. It's their day job. It's in their job description. Um, and I've not seen, and I've oh, hundreds of, literally hundreds of escalations. I'm not aware of or conscious of negative consequence to an escalation internally within the retailer. Can we get the, the senior category manager's view on this? You know, this we're clearly not getting the conclusion. I'd, I'd like to get, you know, a, a, a other input on this, or we'd like this reviewed by by a senior, senior person. Buyers are thicker skinned than you think. Um, you know, they might say, oh, I'm really disappointed that people are going to escalate. You know, I, I thought we could get this deal done between us. Um, if they, if you've got the deal done with the buyer without escalation, there was probably more wiggle room that you could have pushed for. The deals that are the toughest and the best outcome for suppliers almost always rely upon escalation because they've gone outside of the remit of the buyer to agree. So I wouldn't view escalation within the retailer as an issue. I'd view it as a badge of honor. If you haven't escalated, you haven't pushed hard enough, frankly, um, because the buyer is still operating well within that comfort zone and haven't given the, uh, the, the, the end of what they could possibly give. So... Escalation within retailer is something that we absolutely advocate and do regularly, almost every time, all the way through to um, to GMs. No issue at all with GMs. Their job description is to manage these issues. Um, they are way more conscious, again, around retribution and, and consequence to those conversations. Um, and it would be a pretty juvenile uh, play for them to, uh, to uh, um, have a crack at a supplier for genuinely asking for consideration through escalation. The last point is always one of those um, challenging ones. So there are um, arbiters being put in place. Before there was co-compliance managers within Woolworths and Coles. That didn't really work out particularly well in terms of suppliers' trust to go to them. So uh, Treasury government decided to put the um, independent arbiters in place, thinking that would fix it. Hasn't really fixed it. Um, um, and there's been very limited formal complaints through the arbiters and all the uh, co-compliance managers in the last um uh, seven eight years, which is um, is something that Chris Leptos, the independent um, uh, reviewer appointed by government, is looking at, and we expect to see some changes over the course of uh, late twenty three, early twenty four. Um, but there is a provision within the code that says if you do ask the independent arbiter to review a decision, the arbiter then has a responsibility to make sure, post the complaint, that you're not dealt with uh, punitively or negatively or harshly after the complaint. So there is provision specifically a safety net that if the buyer then goes, well, I'll get those buggers, um, there is a provision that they have to keep a watching brief to make sure that doesn't occur. And I've spoken to enough GMs in Wolves and Coles to know that they're smart enough to go, you know what, just leave that supplier alone. Don't make waves, don't pick on them, leave them be. We, particularly if it was found in the supplier's favor, you'll probably find they'll treat you with kick gloves actually. Um, because they don't want to upset you in any any way, shape, or form, because they know they're being watched by the arbiter. I know that's you know little solace, and they're easy words for me to say. Difficult calls to make as a supplier, but certainly seeking counsel from them is in confidence is a, is a good first step. And I certainly would advocate um, in you know the most you know, egregious situations escalating to the arbiters as it's their job to manage this to your benefit going going through. Last slide from me. Um, you know, if you want further help, Lisa, I said we're, we're going to be running a two-day NEG program for you guys. Um, there's also the the one-day grocery code of conduct, and so I've offered to Lucy that we'll happily run those one one run for free for you. You guys should so, and we've run well, as a business. We've trained probably best part of five thousand people in grocery code. I can count on probably two hands the number of people from the the fruit and veg industry. So it's a blind spot in in your space. Um, and I would love your industry to better understand what the grocery code can do uh, for you. Um, if you want to purchase an e-learning package, we can do that as well, but I'm happy to do a virtual on the screen for you guys anyway. Um, and we certainly, on, on, on price movement and those fights, um, that's what we do for a living if, uh, if you're so inclined to, uh, to get external help. Thank you, Neil. That was uh, very interesting um, and very informative. And uh, it's very interesting to hear about the, the arbiter and the relationship there um, because I know anecdotally from growers that they're quite fearful of actually 
reaching out and, and taking any action. But thank you very much uh, for your presentation today. It was very informative and thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, and we'll send out some information about the two-day course and we'll set a date for the Food and Grocery Code because I'm sure that will be um, of interest to everyone as well. So thanks very Super. much, Neil. Thank you for having me. Great to, great to come and uh, share with you guys. See you later. Bye. See ya.